Alrighty, in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to put together a very, very simple Android application. It's going to be a very, very straightforward overview. We're not going to go in depth into much at all. Now, I'm doing this on purpose. I'm doing this on purpose because I want you guys to see basically all of the moving parts from start to finish. Now, this is basically, you can think of this as a breadth, breadth, is that how you pronounce it? Breadth for search. I Pronunciation and me don't work together very well sometimes. <laughs> um, breadth. breadth for search, where, uh, where we're just going to look at the high level components. We're going to look at um, how to create a project, how to run that project, how to manipulate some views, how to create a new activity and go between the two things. Now, I'm really not going to explain much. Uh, I'm going to try to keep the commentary to a minimum to try to keep this video short. You can follow along or not. Uh, because we'll be explaining all of this stuff again in the future. But I want to be able to really quickly get a lot of terminology out of the way. I want people to get an idea of what an activity is and what a view is and, and how to construct views and how to, how to work with them and how to launch different activities with data and all of that fun stuff. So it'll be a very quick overview. I, I can't, I really am trying to stress that. So if at any part you're like, oh, what's this thing? I don't understand. We're going to be going more in depth later. But I always find it's very important to show people an end-to-end -end example of how the platform we're teaching works so that they have an idea and sort of a bird's eye view of what to expect. All right, so I'm going to start off by launching Android Studio. Now, the first thing I'm going to do with Android Studio is I detest light themes. I hate light themes with a passion passion of a thousand suns i light themes hurt my eyes that i don't there's no reason to use light themes in my opinion now if you like light themes uh, don't get offended i just really really don't like them now fortunately android studio is based off of JetBrains's intellij ide which happens to have a very very nice dark theme installed into it so fortunately that dark theme did get carried over and we can switch to it very easily so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to go over to configure and i'm going to go it. into settings do it. Oh, I'm going to do it. Um, now that I'm in this incredibly intimidating settings panel, which we'll talk about settings a little bit more. Basically, I'm going to start to get a little bit more and more fed up with some of the defaults, and I'm going to change them throughout the series. Maybe we'll have a video about talking about all the defaults that I typically will change, uh, besides the appearance, which, of course, I have to change right now. Um, so don't get too terrified of this uh, settings window. I thought you were going to say we were going to do a video about how you get more and more fed up. No, well, we could do that. <laughs> so um, under the IDE settings, click on the appearance. And under the theme drop down, check Dracula. Or Darkula. Not Dracula. I always pronounce it Dracula in my mind, but it's Darkula. Anyway, I'll go ahead and select Darkula and hit OK. And then you'll want to hit restart, because as you'll notice, some of the things turned dark and some of the things didn't. It's really, really ugly and whatever. Hit restart. And now we have a dark theme. Okay, so how do we create a new project? Let's say I want to create the next best awesome, bring in $10 million of venture capitalist money mobile application. How do we do that? Well, we click on the Start a New Android Studio Project button right here. So I'm going to click that. And uh, we're going to be presented with a wizard. So under application name, I'm just going to go ahead and call this something like uh, Android Quick Start or something. Um, and uh, for the company domain, I'm going to leave that as nelson.example.com. We will talk about that later. And uh, for the project location, and I already have a path in mind for where I want to put this. So I'm going to go ahead and remove all of this stuff and uh, just paste in this path that I that I like. I really like this path. That makes me happy. So um, you could really place this project wherever you want on your hard drive. You could leave it as the default if you want. But I have a particular place I want to stuff it. So um, yeah, so go ahead and set your application name. Change your project location if you want to. And then hit next. This is another important screen. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more uh, later because it involves discussing the ridiculous API level naming convention things and a bunch of desserts. But um, for now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say for the minimum SDK, we're actually gonna switch this over to uh, Android 4.1. 
And you'll notice that Android 4.1 will allow us to target 82.6% of all devices. That's a really handy little thing it puts there. Um, for comparison, if we wanted to only target Lollipop, uh, it's less than 1%, which isn't that great. Uh, Kit Kat is going to be 33%. Jelly Bean is going to be 40 Another Jelly Bean is going to be 61 And this Jelly Bean is going to be 82 Oh, I didn't know you could do that. So you can actually like, click on that, and it'll show you this breakdown. That's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. But anyway, uh, we are absolutely not going to be supporting Honeycomb, nor are we going to be supporting anything in 2. Uh, those devices are on the way out, and you are pretty safe not developing towards them, um, or to them. So we're going to be working on 4.1 as the minimum SDK level. Now, that's important. The minimum SDK just means what's the what's the oldest device that we could that we can write this for. Uh, it'll change what APIs we have access to. So um, 4.1 is a great uh, compromise between uh, APIs and compatibility. So let's hit next. Uh, we'll get this. What is all this stuff? Ah, it's terrifying. We have activities and fragments and maps activities and full screen activities and navigation drawers. Uh, don't worry about it. We'll talk about it later. For now, what we're going to do is we're going to select blank activity. And we're going to hit next. Uh, well, it'll ask us a bunch of stuff about our activity, uh, but I'm just going to leave the defaults. The defaults are fine, so I'm going to hit finish. Uh, so a quick note, uh, we are going to be using the wizards. Uh, as you just saw, we used that wizard to create that activity and all that fun stuff. Uh, let's give the firewall exception. Um, so we're going to be use, using wizards in this video, but in the later videos, we're going to be doing things manually just so you can see what's going on behind the scenes. But basically, uh, other thing, uh, blah, 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 I don't want, go away, and it froze. Okay, so while this is frozen, uh, let's basically talk about what an activity is. Um, well, actually, no. Let's just, uh, let's just see what happens when we get all that fun stuff. Okay, so what we're going to do, what we're going to see after we launch this project are is two files that are open. Mainactivity.java, which is a Java class and activity underscore main.xml, which is a resource. Specifically, it's a layout resource. Now, a layout is like you would expect it to be, basically just a way to describe how the UI is constructed. So you'll notice we have this designer, and the designer actually isn't terrible as far as designers go. However, we will be spending the vast majority of our time in the text view. So you'll notice at the bottom left of the screen, we have the text view. So the text view will allow us to edit the layout's XML code, which we will be discussing in depth. So don't worry about all this stuff. Uh, and it also shows us a preview of what it looks like on a phone. Um, we'll be talking about all the preview stuff later as well. So, um, so if you're curious, the activity main XML file is under your resource folder, layout folder, activity main. And your main activity.java file is under Java, your package name, followed by the class. Now, we'll talk about Java classes and packages a little bit later for all you C-sharp folks out there when we have a more in-depth discussion about activities. So uh, I gave you a brief rundown of what a layout is. It's basically a way to describe your UI. Uh, an activity, you can think of an activity as just a self-contained screen. Um, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between screens you see on your Android app and activities. Every screen you have will be at its own activity. An activity is kind of an island of self-contained functionality. And it's very, very important because as we start discussing activity lifecycle and how the, uh, how the Android operating system deals with resource management and how it can pause your app and all that fun stuff, it's going to be really important to think of activities as very self-contained units of functionality that should not have many dependencies on other activities in your application. Anyway, so uh, why is main activity extending action bar activity? Because it is. We'll talk about that later. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and run this. That's going to be the first thing I want to do is I, I want to go ahead and I want to run this application, uh, even though it doesn't do a whole lot. Now we will be going back, we'll be editing it and show you guys some fun stuff. Um, just some really cool, simple stuff uh, just to get a bird's eye view of things. But for now, I just want to run this. So I'm going to launch Getting Motion. 
and I'm going to launch my Google Nexus 5 emulator with that progress bar optical illusion thing. Is it a black progress bar or white progress bar? It will get to you. <laughs> Considering how much time I've spent looking at that progress bar, <laughs> it's really not even funny. Anyway, so... Uh, Okay, so here's our uh, our Android virtual device. So how do we run this? Well, it's pretty straightforward. We go up to the Run uh, menu item on the toolbar or on the File menu, and we hit Run App. And when we do that, it will. You'll see. Notice down here it says Gradle executing tasks. Now, what is a Gradle, and what is a task? We'll talk about that later. Okay, so now that that just uh, came up, it'll give you the device chooser dialog. Uh, now I happen to actually have an Android device plugged into my computer right now, but I haven't authorized it to this computer, uh, which is why it's there's like unauthorized right there. It says it twice because apparently it's very important that it's unauthorized. Um, we're, for obvious reasons, we're not gonna be uh, deploying to the physical device I have sitting next to me. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna select the Getty Motion Google Nexus 5 Android emulator. So um, the great thing about Gaining Motion is that it'll automatically register your device, your virtual device, with ADB, the Android Debug Bridge, which, again, we'll talk about later, but in short, the ADB is the interface between your computer and your Android devices. Now, Gaining Motion has registered our virtual device with ADB so that it shows up in our device chooser dialog. So I can just click it. Uh, I could I could double click it right here, but instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here to this checkbox that says use same device for future launches, and I'm going to check it. Now what this this but this checkbox does is it well <laughs> uses same device for future launches, so the next time we launch something it won't ask us for a device. However, if the devices that are plugged into our computer changes or we ask it to start a different activity than we usually do, the choose device dialog will pop back up again. So anyway, let's go ahead and hit OK. And we're going to see that down there. We're going to see initializing ADB. We're going to see the scary red stuff. And uh, if we come back here to Getting Motion, we see indeed we have an application. So um, this application will make you millions of dollars. It's so amazing. Um, basically, it has a action bar with a title. It has a menu button with a settings button that doesn't do anything. And it says, hello world. Okay, I lied, this is really boring. Um, let's go ahead and do something a little fun for this because I, I wanna show you guys just how we um, how we add a new activity and how do we interact between activities. So, uh, and also I wanna show you guys uh, how we work with our layouts. Just really, really basic overarching things just so I can just get some terminology out of the way very quickly. Again, I have to reiterate, if you don't know what's going on, that's okay. I just wanna get some terminology out of the way. Okay, so on activity main, what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to nuke it. And um, we're going to start writing it from scratch. So what do I want? What is my goal here? Well, my goal is I wanna go ahead and I wanna create a view that has a text box and a button in it. And that text box will allow us to enter some text. And then when I hit the button, I want it to switch to a new activity and display that text on the different activity. So let's go about writing a layout uh, view file from scratch. So I'm gonna open up a root element. So as you, as you may know, if you've worked with XML, all XML files must have a root element and they, we open them up with this tag syntax. Uh, if you've worked with HTML or XML, you'll be familiar with this syntax. And what I'm gonna enter is a linear layout. What is a linear layout? A linear layout is what's called a view group. It allows us to compose different groups into it, and it shows, makes them display in certain ways. It's a container class. It's like a div if you've worked with HTML. Now, the linear layout is a particular kind of view group that displays all of our stuff in sequence, uh, one after another, either horizontally or vertically. If you've worked with WPF, XAML, Silverlight, or whatever, you'll be familiar with this as the, or familiar with this concept as the stack panel. Anyway, uh, another important thing to understand about uh, views is we have to use an XML namespace. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in XMLNS, 
which looks really scary if you haven't seen it before, but what it stands for is XML namespace. Now, what is an XML namespace? Well, it's just like a programming namespace in C Sharp. It allows us to group together similar things. Now, in XML namespace, what, we, we're, we're good, we're, bleh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow it with a colon and the word Android, and then we're gonna say equals. Now, I'm gonna say equals and enter some quotes. Then I'm gonna hit control space. And that's because in reality, there's really only a handful of XML namespaces that we're gonna use with view files. And uh, one of them is gonna, then the main one is going to be the APK slash res slash Android. And fortunately, Android Studio will autocomplete this for us if we hit control space. So I'm gonna type that in and we have that. Uh, next up, the linear layout requires something called an orientation. So I'm gonna type in ORI to start orientation. Notice how the autocomplete window basically ignores the fact that I haven't specified it with the Android namespace because all these properties exist within the Android namespace and we can just start typing in ORI to come up with orientation and autocomplete it with the Android namespace. So I'll hit enter and I'm gonna do vertical. So remember the, um, the linear layout allows us to stack views vertically or horizontally. So we're gonna do vertical. The next thing I'm gonna do is gonna look a little weird, but we have to do it anyway. I'm gonna say layout underscore width equals match parent and layout height. Now notice how I'm typing in just layout underscore height and then I'm hitting enter. That's so it auto completes with this Android prefix and the Android prefix is required for accessing any attribute that comes from the Android namespace. So I'm gonna say match parent. And so what am I doing there? So I'm saying layout width and layout height. Well, every single object in the view hierarchy, which we'll have a lot of fun time talking about later, every single object within the hierarchy requires us to specify how wide and how high it is. Now, there are some special constants that we can use instead of pixel units. And th those are match parent and wrap content. Match parent means it'll extend to the extents of its parent view, which in the case of the root element of a layout is going to be the activity itself. So when I say layout width equals match parent, I'm saying, and layout height equals match parent, I'm saying I want this view group to extend to the entirety of its parent activity. Okay, now that we've done that, I'm going to throw in some padding for fun. So I'm just going to type in PAD and hit enter and type in 16 DP. Then I'm gonna close the element. So now we're looking at this. Okay, so what is this 16 DP? Um, those are device independent pixels. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, in essence, device independent pixels allow us to specify uh, pixels in a way that's device independent, which is probably why it's called device independent pixels. But, okay, a, a better explanation. You know how different devices have different DPIs, different DOS per inch, um, you know, the whole retina display on, on the iPhones and all the phones that came out after that, you know, kind mm -hmm. of matched the high resolution. Well, device-independent pixels mimic the concept of a pixel when working with high-resolution res high screens that are still small in width, so high-density screens. And we'll talk about the actual math of calculating that later. Anyway, so we have a linear layout. You'll notice we have the beginning, we have the attributes, including the most important thing right here, the XML namespace, and then the ending tag. Now, fortunately, we only have to specify the XML namespace once because of the way XML works. When you specify an XML namespace, that namespace is available to that element as well as all child elements. Considering this is the root element and the only elements that'll exist in the root, that stands to reason that our Android um, namespace will be available to every subsequent element. Okay, so let's go ahead and enter in an edit text. Now, what is an edit text? Okay, so here's this is important. If you guys want to work with views quickly and um, e effectively, you're going to have to learn how to use the tools. So what I did was I opened a tag and I typed in a capital E D I T and then I hit enter. And so what did that do for me? Well, it basically generated the required code for working with an edit text. Now an edit text is a view. 
It's not a view group because it doesn't contain other views. It's a view in and of itself. Um, other terms for what you might think of this as is a control or a widget, depending on what API or what different um, SDKs or platforms you're familiar with. Um, this would be like an inline element in HTML, an element that can't contain children. You'll notice, also notice that it automatically put in our my layout width and my layout height, setting them to a blank value. Again, that's because layout width and layout height are required. So on layout width, I'm going to go ahead and say match parent. And on layout height, I'm going to do something a little bit more interesting. I'm going to say wrap content. So what does that mean? Well, it means this edit text is going to its width is going to extend into its parent. What is its parent? The linear layout. Its height, however, is going to wrap its content. Now, if I set its height to match parent, it'll extend horizontal or vertically across the entire parent. I don't want that. What I want is I want the edit text to be as big as it needs to be to display itself. So I'm going to use wrap content. So we use wrap content when we want the control or the view in Android speak anyway, to decide for itself how t wide or how tall it needs to be. That's when we use wrap content. So we don't want to put in a specific pixel value here because depending on the style of this application, we'll talk about styles and themes later, the edit text control may be taller or shorter. So we really don't want to constrain it to be a particular height. We want it to decide how high it is. And that's why we give it the value of wrap content. You'll notice another very interesting thing right here. Look at over here in this, this preview. You can't see it very well, so maybe I can zoom in. But you'll notice a control appeared. You'll also notice that it's 16 pixels from the side and 16 pixels from the top. What's that due to? Well, that's due to my padding that I set on its parent element on the linear layout. So this control, you'll notice it extends the, all the way across the screen and it is as high as it needs to be to display its content. This is a nice little text box. Uh, there's two more properties I want to give it. The first is hint. Now again, you don't have to type in Android colon, even though this comes from the Android namespace. You just have to type in hint and then hit enter. So get in the habit of doing that. It'll save you a lot of keystrokes. Anyway, so on hint, I'm going to say enter your name. Now watch that. That's pretty cool right there. We see that, you know how it's a very common um, design style to have a, like a, the label of a text view or a text control, like have its label inside the text control and have it grayed out. Then when you click on it, the label goes away. Well, that's what we've just done there. And you see that it's been reflected on our preview panel, which we haven't talked much about the preview panel, but it's here and it's awesome. And that's all you need to know for now. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to type in a margin bottom. So I just typed in margin BO and I hit enter and I'm going to give it a margin bottom of 8 DP. The last thing I'm going to do is going to be interesting because you might be saying, okay, so that's cool that you're sitting here in, in XML land typing out your XML code and doing fun stuff and making the preview show up and all that cool, awesome stuff. But you might be asking yourself, how do you access this object? from within our activity. How, do, how, how does that work? I mean, there has to be a way to do it. Otherwise, it would be a very useless control if you couldn't access it in your actual code, in your actual Java. Well, the way that we do that is through the use of IDs. IDs are very similar to the concept of an ID in HTML, where we specify an element as having a unique name that is not shared in any other element. And we have that be um, accessible by a particular name. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in ID and then hit space or enter as always. And I'm going to type in something really weird. I'm going to type in at plus ID forward slash. Then I'm going to type in activity underscore main underscore name. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, we're going to talk about resources later, but uh, the quick thing or the quick explanation for what this is, is this plus symbol. This at symbol means we're dealing with a resource. This plus symbol means we're adding a new resource. The ID means the kind of resource that we're adding is a named ID. And the name followed, following the slash is the actual 
name of that ID. In this case, I'm following a convention that I'm going to follow through the throughout this entire course because IDs are globally unique within the entire application. You never want two things to have the same ID unless you know what you're doing. There are cases where you will, uh, such as if you're developing a layout file for a tablet and a phone and want to choose between them dynamically, you might want to reuse the same IDs. But for the most part, you want your IDs to be unique. What's a very easy way to guarantee uniqueness? Well, you just prefix the uh, prefix the ID by what layout file it's in. We're in activity main.xml, so let's go ahead and prefix this ID with activity main, followed by the actual name and the ID that I want. In this case, it's name. So that's how we're going to make sure that we're going to be fairly unique with our activities or with our IDs. But anyway, this ID will let me access this control from within Java. That's very important. We're going to be doing this on most of our controls. Okay, um, one quick note. You might be noticing lint getting irritated at you. What is lint? Well, lint is a uh, code quality tool that Android Studio uses to make sure that we're not doing anything stupid. It has a lot of awesome suggestions built into it that'll warn you about potential dumb things that you might be doing that are, will inevitably result in the destruction of the universe. In this case, it's telling me that into your name should be in the string resource, well, or use a string resource. We'll talk about that later. Uh, the short of it is this is an internationalization issue. Um, we're not going to be doing a whole lot of internationalization in this project due to time constraints, but we will discuss it. Anyway, it'll be safe to ignore this error, or this warning rather, because it's a warning, it's not going to prevent your code from compiling or from working. All right, what's the last thing we need? We need a button. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do, now it's important that you start with the capital B, U-T-T-O-N. The reason for that is for some reason, the autocomplete in XML doesn't recognize the autocomplete if I'm using a lowercase name for whatever reason, I don't even understand. But if you start with an uppercase button, then magically it'll decide, oh, I know about that thing. And it'll show you an autocomplete uh, drop down for it. So I, you can really just type in BU and then hit enter. And what do we get? We pretty much get the same thing we got with the edit text because button is not a layout group. It is a view, or again, it's a control or a widget. And uh, it's gonna have their two required properties that are always required. It's width and it's height. Now, what are these values gonna be? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and give this a wrap content and then I'm gonna hit enter and I'm gonna type in wrap content again. Now, why am I doing wrap content on both of these? Well, really it's just to show you guys how to, um, or what happens when you tell a control to wrap content on both the width and the height. You'll notice that the width and the height of this button is gonna be determined by the content that is within it. Okay, so for that matter, how do we add content in the button? Well, it's pretty straightforward. We just type in text, now hit enter, don't, do text equals, do text enter. Again, the reason for that is you need the Android namespace prefix. And if you don't have that, your code won't compile. Anyway, so for the text, we're going to do confirm name or something dumb like that. Now notice what's interesting is the button got larger. Why did it get larger? Well, it got larger because the content inside of it dictated that it, the button needed to be larger in order to fit it. And I have its layout width set to wrap content. So that's what happens when we have wrap content set on the width and the height. Uh, you'll also notice that Lint is complaining again about confirm name should use string resource. Again, we're not going to worry about that. Okay, so how do I handle a click event? Now, if you're familiar with HTML, WPF, uh, WinForms, anything ever made, you will be familiar with the concept of a click event. A click event is a piece of code that you want to happen when somebody clicks that button. Now, buttons are made for clicking, and if you have a button without a click event, it won't do a whole lot of stuff when you press it, which is not a useful button. So how do we do that? Well, there's two ways to do it, but we're going to do the easy way. Uh, the way in that we're probably not going to do any more for the rest of the series, uh, but just because it's easy, quick, and straightforward, and that's what we're going to do. 
And um, there's another way to do it, but we'll worry about that later. So how do we do it? Let's type in ON, and we see on the autocomplete, onClick appears. So we hit enter. And what do we type in to onClick? Well, it shouldn't surprise a person familiar with WPF, but what we type into onClick is the name of the method we want to be invoked on the activity that owns this view, or this layout, rather. So what I'm going to do is, on onClick, I'm going to say, um, confirm name, sure. Now it's going to give me a warning, but this warning actually makes sense. It says method confirm name is missing in main activity or has incorrect signature. So that's actually a good warning. It's telling us we typed in a name for it to invoke, but we haven't made that, that method yet. So we typed in the name of the method, but there is no method that matches that name, which is, you know, not going to work because there's no method. So that's what we're going to do next. But before we do that, um, let's just take a quick look at our layout file. Again, a layout file is nothing more than a way to specify your user interface using XML. Uh, there are two types of elements you're going to be using. You're going to be using view groups and views. View groups are like this linear layout right here. They allow you to put views inside of them. Views are like these buttons and this text box. They're individual widgets that perform some specific functionality. A couple of required things. You need this XMLNS uh, Android to equal this particular value. And you need to specify virtually all, but not all of them, but virtually all of your attributes using the Android namespace. Second, every view group and every view must specify its layout width in this layout height. Third, you do not or sh typically shouldn't uh, provide a static pixel or device independent pixel value for width or height. Instead, you should use a combination of match parent and wrap content. And that's really about it. So if your code file, if your uh, layout looks like mine, then you'll be ready to go. Uh, we could see how this looks on our emulator actually by hitting this run button up here. So I'm gonna hit this run button and um, it should compile even though we're missing this method. And it does. So now we can come down here and we can see our awesome view. So we have this, this thing right here where we can type stuff into, which is really cool. And we can press this button and pressing the button crashes the app because we haven't named that, made that method yet. But anyway, I uh, just wanted to show you guys how that layout looked on the device. All right, so let's go over to our main activity and actually make our confirm main name method. Okay, so you see all this stuff? Let's ignore all of this stuff. So what we're doing is we're working inside of public class main activity, which extends action bar activity. Uh, we're not worrying about any of this other syntax. We're not worrying about these methods at all because we will be discussing all of them in depth later. The only thing we are concerned about doing is providing some click event handler for our button. So coming back here, we have confirm name is the name of our method. Our method must match that name. It also must do a couple other things. First of all, it must be public. So we'll give it the public access modifier. It must return nothing. So we'll give it a void return type. It must have that, that name, that very exact name that we typed into XML. And it also must take in one parameter of type view. Okay, another quick tip. I typed in view again with a capital V. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hit enter. What did that do? Well, if we scroll up, you'll notice it brought in an import. That's really important. If your code does not compile because it says something about view not accessible and view not found, scroll up to the top of your file and add an import for Android view view. We'll talk about imports a little bit more later for people who aren't as familiar with Java. All right, the parameter could be called whatever we want, so we'll just call it view. Okay, so what does confirm name want to do? Well, what I want it to do is I want it to launch a new activity. So I kind of need to create an activity first for us to be able to launch that activity. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to right click this package right here underneath app, Java, and then the package name. Uh, we'll talk about packages later. Now, right-click this, I'll select New, 
And then under activity, I'm going to select blank activity, which if you recall is the exact same template that we use with our main activity. So I'm going to select that and it'll give us an activity name. In this case, I am going to change the activity name. I'm going to call it confirm name activity. And then I'm going to hit finish because I'm not worrying about any of the other parameters. Now, when we create our confirm name activity, what's going to happen is we will have a new class right here, confirm name activity, that looks scarily similar to our main activity because, well, they're generated from the same template. And under our layout folder, which if, if this isn't expanded, be sure to open up your res folder, open up your layout folder, and you'll see activity confirm name. So I'm not going to worry about the... Um, uh, the view just yet with activity confirm name. In fact, I'm not even going to worry about extracting out that data from our um, our into your name edit, edit text yet. All I want to do, all I want to accomplish right now is I want to launch confirm name activity. So how do we do that? Well, in Android activities, you can think of them as islands of functionality. They're self-contained units that really don't like to talk to each other and shouldn't talk to each other. The only way in which an activity should communicate with another activity is through the Android API. Now, if you guys can repeat that in your head 10 times, please do, because that's a very, very important concept about working with Android. Activities are self-contained units of functionality that include both the functionality of the activity itself, along with the corresponding user interface. When they communicate with each other, they do so indirectly through Android. The reason this is important is because activities are baked, the concept of an activity is baked right into the core idea of the Android operating system. And activities are the point in which um, things like uh, power management and all that fun stuff, the back button on your device and uh, task switching and all that fun stuff is dealt with, it's handled through activities. So if you want to communicate between one activity to another, you need to do so indirectly. But that still leaves us the question, how do we go about actually launching the confirm name activity from this confirm name method? We do so through the concept of an intent. An intent is this little, it's this little package of data that kind of describes something you want to have happen. You construct this little package of data with saying that I kind of want this sort of kind of thing to happen. And then you tell Android to go do it. And Android goes out and does it. That's basically what an intent is. So what we want to do is we want to create an intent that resolves to, which is a technical Android term, that the intent resolves to the confirm name activity so that the Android operating system knows that that's the thing we're trying to launch. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, this is important. I'm going to type in I-N-T-E-N-T, -E -E then I'm going to hit enter. Why is that important? because Android Studio just popped a new import statement at the top of my file. If you get an error about intent not being found, make sure to add and using or import android.intent at the top of your file, just like you see right here. Or actually it's Android content intent. <laughs> really? Android content intent. Did that programmer who named that ever say that out loud? <laughs> anyway, um... So under confirm name, we have an intent object. Let's go ahead and create it. I'm going to call this confirm name intent, and I'm going to instantiate it. So I'm going to say new intent. And if we look at the parameters, we will see we have a variety of constructor overloads to work with. Uh, we can do no parameters. We can pass in another intent. We can pass in an action, an action in the URI, a package class, a class, an action URI. Um, or context, sorry, uh, or an action URI uh, context in a class. What we want is we want the context and class overload. So how do we fill these parameters? Well, for the context, I'm going to pass in this, because an activity is a context. We will be absolutely discussing context later because they're very important to Android, but not right now. So the first parameter, or the first argument, rather, we're specifying is this. The second parameter that we need to specify is the class of the activity we want to launch. In this case, it's going to be confirm name activity. 
Now again, I typed that in, then I hit enter so that we get the proper import at the top of the file, which actually, I'm stupid. Um, don't mind me. Uh, classes in the same packages don't need imports. I swear I can Java. Anyway, uh, it'll be confirm name activity dot class. Again, you won't need to do an import statement for that. Okay, so that's our intent. So what do we do with the intent now that we've created it, right? It's just, right now it's just a DTO. You can think of it just like a little parcel of data that describes a, a well, describes an intent, an app name for it. What do we do? We pass it to start activity. Now the start activity method is given to us by the activity base class. And what it expects is an intent. So I'm gonna pass in confirm name intent. So what happens here? Well, we create the intent, we describe what we want to do, and then we tell Android to go ahead and do the thing we just described for it to do. And that was a lot of talking for two lines of code. Anyway, let's go ahead and hit the, hit the uh, run button because now our button should actually work. So now if I hit confirm name, check that out. Confirm name activity pops up. And if I hit the back button, check that out. We go back to our previous activity. So that is pretty cool right there. All right, the last part of this video is how do we get this data into this activity? Okay, so what I wanna do is, um, this is gonna be a multi, uh, multi-step process, unfortunately, that's gonna require a little bit of jumping around. Um, to minimize the jumping around, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off with the activity confirm name XML file. So this is the layout for the confirm name activity. For its text view, I'm gonna format it slightly differently. I'm gonna leave everything as it is, except for I'm gonna give it an ID. Remember, the ID allows us to reference this view from within our activity code. Then I'm gonna say at plus ID slash activity confirm name, and we're gonna call this text. And that's it. So again, by giving it an ID, we can now access it from our Java code. So let's come over here to confirm name activity. So as a programmer, asking you guys, how would you go about passing data from main activity to confirm name activity? Would you use a constructor? Would you use a setter? Would you use some sort of message bus? Would you use something like that? And the answer is none of those things. The answer is that data needs to get packaged along with the intent. The intent needs to contain every single piece of data that is required for the activity it is resolving to, to run. In this case, that means the confirm name activity, because I want it to display what we typed in that text box in this text field, it needs to have in its intent that data. So how do we do that? Well, it turns out that intents also act as dictionaries. If you're familiar with C Sharp or maps, if you're familiar with C++ or associative arrays, if you're familiar with PHP or objects, if you're familiar with JavaScript, Basically, the concept is intents are little packages of data, and we can put arbitrary values into them for us to extract after the corresponding resolve to activity executes. So what I'm gonna do here is the onCreate method, I'm going to do three things. A, I'm going to acquire a reference to this text view inside of code. B, I'm going to extract the thing that was passed into me from main activity, which we haven't passed in yet, we'll do that as, as the last step. And then C, I'm gonna set the text of the reference, the, the, the text view that we're referencing to the string that was passed in from main activity. So this should be super exciting. I'm doing it in the onCreate method, and I'm doing it after we've done super onCreate and set content view, both of which we'll talk about later, but it is incredibly important you write this code after both of those method calls. Okay, first thing, I need to get a reference to the object that represents my text view. How do I do that? Well, let's start off with typing in text view. Now I'm gonna type in text view, then I'm going to hit enter. Again, that's gonna bring in this import statement. If you hit space instead, you will not get this import statement. Get in the habit of hitting enter on your autocomplete windows. 
So we're gonna call text view text, and I'm gonna say equals cast to text view, find view by ID. So what's going on here? Well, we have this find view by ID method that's given to us by our activity. And surprisingly, what it does it isn't what you expect it to do. Uh, actually, what it does is it finds the view by ID. So it goes into the, the layout and it finds that view that you specified by the ID and it and returns it. It's a really straightforward method name, actually. I don't have no issues with this method name. But unfortunately, seeing as it's not a, a generic method, we will have to cast its result to the specific view type that we, that we expect. Because find view by ID will return the base view class, it's not going to return the specific view type that we want to manipulate. In this case, we want to manipulate a text view, so we have to perform the cast. Okay, so what, what argument is find view by ID expecting? Well, it's expecting an ID. It's expecting this. But how do we access this from Java? The answer is through magic. What we're going to do is we're going to type in R. I'm going to um, hit enter, right? So I import R. Well, actually, R wasn't imported. It exists in the namespace. And then I'm going to hit dot ID dot activity confirm name text. See, I told you it was magic. So if you're a programmer, you're probably here sitting here scratching your head. You're probably thinking, well, you got this string here in this XML file, and then suddenly you're referencing it as a constant in code. Remember when I said this is magic? I wasn't kidding. Um, basically what happens, a very short rundown, uh, Android will look at all of the resources that you create, including these IDs, and it'll create this special magical class called R, which... Uh, Presumably stands for resource. Let me into R. It's not going to let me into R. I wanted to show you guys R, but it keeps on sending me to this actual ID. Anyway, the R uh, is a generated class by Android that contains a static constant value for every single ID. Whenever you reference an ID from within code, always access it through your R generated class. Okay, second step. Extract the string passed in from main activity into confirm name activity. How do we do that? Well, let's start off with uh, something pretty straightforward. We need a string. Now, this is uppercase S for all you C sharp programmers out there. Um, the primitive string type in Java is an uppercase S. We're going to say string name equals, but now what? Okay, so, we, so first sensical thing was to create a string called name. It seems pretty straightforward and um, something very programmy to do. But we have to extract what we want from main activity out from this. How do we do that? Well, remember how I said main activity is going to be stuffing that data inside of this intent. So it'd be really awesome if we could actually get a reference to that intent from within our other activity. And in fact, Android lets us do that through the aptly named get intent method. See, as much as I gripe about Android for a lot of different reasons that we'll be getting into later, some of their method names really do make a whole lot of sense. Get intent gets the intent that started this activity. There's not a whole lot else to say about it. So let's hit enter. Okay, so now we're looking at the intent object. How do we extract data out from the intent object? Well, if we hit dot, we'll get an autocomplete for all of the members on intent. Um, and we'll notice we have these get extra methods. So we have things like get boolean array extra, get boolean extra, get bundle extra, get char extra, blah, 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 blah. An extra is an additional piece of data we stuffed into an intent. That's all an extra is. So for example, going back to my dictionary of string and string analogy uh, being a intent, uh, getting an extra is like accessing a member on it. We're accessing an arbitrary piece of data that was tacked on to the person who initiated that intent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say get string extra because this is typed. Java is a typed language. We have to specify the type we want. So we're going to say get string extra and we're going to type in a name as a string. And we're just going to say name. Now you might be saying, where does this where does this variable come from? Well, we haven't set it yet. We haven't quite gotten to the point where we set this value in main activity yet. 
So right now, if you were to run this code, name this variable would be null because we haven't specified, uh, we haven't put that extra in from the main activity, but we will soon. Anyway, third step, setting the text. That's again, very aptly named. Remember, we have a reference to the text object that was instantiated due to the inflation, ooh, a new word, we'll talk about that later, of this text view, um, referenced by ID. So this object, in order to set the text, we'll simply do text.setText. And we're gonna pass a name as the text because it expects a string and string name is a string and blah, blah, blah. That was also a lot of talking for three, three lines of code. Again, I'm using this video as an opportunity to get as much of the sort of ancillary um, vocabulary out of the way so we can focus on the specifics in later videos. Anyway, text.setText. .text. That's pretty awesome right there. And we're done with the confirm name activity. Not done with the main activity yet because again, we haven't put the extra in yet. So let's go back into main activity. So we have to do something in between creating the intent and starting the activity. What do we have to do? Well, not surprisingly, it's a three-step process again. First, we need to extract this object. I need this edit text right here that's inside of our layout. I need a reference to it inside of Java in order to extract whatever the user typed in. So I'm gonna use the exact same thing that I did in the other instance and find view by ID and access it by ID activity main name. Then I'm going to extract the text out of it, and then I'm going to stuff it into the intent. So let's do that. Uh, this should take a lot less time than the last one because it's basically the same step. I'm going to say edit text name text equals cast to edit text. Remember, I typed in edit text and I hit enter. Uh, the reason I'm reiterating this so many times is that the number one complaint I get from any of the videos I do um, because I mostly do C sharp stuff is, uh, I forgot to, to spe specify that I'm using a particular using statement or something like that. So some, something doesn't resolve and people ask me, well, what, what namespace did that thing come from? That's going to happen 10 times worse with Java because with Java, you import all your classes individually. So to facilitate making that easier, we type in edit text and we hit enter and that's what we do. And it makes the import appear on the top. And I'm sorry I'm repeating this so many times, but it's very important. All right, and then we're gonna type in find view by ID. Then we're gonna access our magical R dot ID dot activity main name, which if you recall was the ID resource that we created inside of our layout file. Next up, I'm going to extract the text that the user typed in. So I'm gonna say name equals name text dot get text dot to string. Now you might be wondering, well, I would imagine the get text method would return a string. Well, you'd be wondering wrong because the get text method returns something called a um, editable, editable, editable. Terrible, terrible word, I hate it. Anyway, an editable is not a string. You won't be able to cast it to a string. So we need to convert it to a string. So we do that by calling to string on it. The final thing we need to do is stuff our name inside of our intent. So I'm gonna say confirm name intent dot set or put extra. And I'm gonna type in two things. First thing I'm gonna type in is the name, which is just name here. This is the name, the string name that we're expecting to pick up on this, this activity. And the second thing I wanna type in is name. So I really just typed in name twice, but one has parentheses or one has quotation, see? <laughs> anyway, this name uh, uh, variable again is what we extracted out of our edit text. Okay, uh, before we run this application and wrap up this video, I want to point out a couple things. First of all, you might be wondering why I'm uh, hard coding in this name value twice. Um, you'd be right, right to wonder that this should be a constant, but I wanted to keep things simple. Second of all, you might be wondering, why am I finding view by ID every time the confirm name button is clicked? Why don't I just find view by ID once inside of our onCreate method and cache it as a local variable? Another thing that I'd be saying to do, but for the reasons of time, I didn't. Anyway, let's go ahead and hit play. Play? <laughs> I'm so used to doing Unity videos now. Uh, 
let's just drop over into our, our project window, open up our hierarchy, create a couple game objects. I was going to let it go, but hey, you called yourself out. <laughs> um, all right, and we have the application running. So let's go ahead and type in a name. My name is Nelson and confirm name. Look at that. We get Nelson LeKay. If my name were Little Pip, it would be Little Pip on the other side. Okay, so this quick, short bird's eye introduction view thing turned out to be a lot less short than I expected it to. But you know what? We got a lot of terminology out of the way. And again, what I really want people to get out of this video, even if you didn't follow along yourself, is the basic end-to-end -end creation of two activities and two views and having them communicate. Because you know what? Most of what we're going to be doing over the next rest of the course is going to amount to nothing more than creating a layout, creating activity, extracting some data out of intent, setting some properties on some views, launching another activity. That's pretty much all you do with Android development. There's a couple other cool stuff that we're going to do, but that's pretty much it. We'll talk about all this stuff more in depth, but again, I wanted people to get an idea of how you go from A to B without necessarily going into the details, such as what does this on create method do? Well, of course, you could just assume that it's the method that's called when it's created, but don't assume that yet because we'll talk about it later. I mean, you'd be right to because that's actually what it... Anyway, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> um... I hope you enjoyed the video. We will see you next time. See you later.